Yoda Encoder and Decoder with me to solve a real life problem. Hello and welcome to Code with Sar. I'm Sar. How are you doing? In this video, we're going to go over the process to create an encoder and a decoder and use that to address a concrete problem that we encountered during the build of Codename K. So what is encoding? It is a process to convert one set of information into another. For example, English characters could be encoded into Morse code. Encoding in that is a process to convert the letters into dots and dashes. And decoding is doing the reverse. Why do we do that? Other than to make it cool in a spy movie, there are various reasons. A major one is to represent the information that couldn't be represented before. The Morse code makes it possible to transfer characters over a long distance wire by telegraph. Another example is ASCII code. It is the foundation of text encoding in modern computers. We all know computers deal with the binaries. So we convert the information that we want to process into 0 or 1 that computers can handle. And voila, the modern technology. Along the side of those uh, huge breakthroughs, encoding and decoding, it's very useful to address some relatively small but concrete issues. One example, I think every one of you are very familiar with is URL encoding. We know that URL have some constraints. For example, you cannot have space. And then, since the N sign is used to separate the different parts for the query, you cannot use it in the query. But wait, space and end shows up in the keywords frequently. What can we do? We encode it. For example, if we try and search what is encoding and decoding in Google, chances are in the browser, you're going to see in the encoded query, Space has been converted to plus sign, and the end sign has been encoded to percent %26. And when the query string reaches the server, we decode it, and we got the original query string. That is a simple concept, but if you think about that, isn't that amazing? We made something impossible become possible. Now, let's take a look at how to use the concept of encoding, decoding, which is learned, to address a concrete problem. If we follow the codename K series, you know that we're going to use the folder to save category information. Let's see a code example. This is a console application. The first line defines a data constant, and I'm going to use that as the base folder for all the data. Then we defined a local function called create category. It does two things. On line four, it combines the data and the category name to forming a relative path for the category folder, and then create the target folder on line five. Line 8 calls create category that we just defined, and it used the first argument as the category name. Let's run the code and see how it works. Oh, by the way, if you find that this file format looks weird to you, it's probably because this is the .NET 6 new feature called top-level statements that is supported in C-Sharp 10. Now I'm trying to get used to it as well. Treat it as if this is the body of the main method. I'm going to run .NET, run, then a category name for 1K savings. As you can see, it creates a folder named for 1k savings under the base of data. It runs as expected. There's no problem, right? Well, what if I have a category named what can go wrong and end it with a question mark? Let's try it. Ooh, it turns out question mark is not allowed here. Well, there's actually more. None of the following characters are allowed. Less than, greater than, colon, Double quote, forward slash, backslash, vertical bar or pipe, question mark. Well, we mentioned the question mark. Asterisk. And there's more. We cannot use any of the following reserved device names for file names. Plus, cannot use those names with the file extension. So not only no is not valid, no.txt is not valid. No dot whatever you put there is either not valid. And no dot or dot dot. I think those are reserved for the current folder or the parent folder. You think that to be it? Hold on. Yes. You cannot end a file or directory name with a space or a period. I hope that's it. So stay tuned. Next. I'll introduce you how to design an encoding decoding system to overcome all these constraints. Before we jump right into coding, let's do some analysis. We are actually dealing with the two types of issues here. The first type is characters that are actually invalid. 
for example, a column, it cannot show up anywhere in the file name. The other type is the valid characters, but they form up a reserved name or they showed up in some special position that is not supported. Let's tackle those types of issues one by another. For type 1, invalid characters, the most intuitive thinking, of course, is to map them to valid characters. For example, less than to 1, greater than to 2, etc, etc. The drawback for this is obvious as well. It is very easy to run into conflicts. For example, category named account column for 1k will be encoded to account 3 for 1k. But if we decode it according to the mapping, we might get account column double quote zero less than k. That is because the forward and the one have conflict there, right? Well, the example is simple, but the concept of conflict is very, very important when we design algorithms to do encoding decoding. In other words, for decoding to work, all the conflicts have to be resolved. We cannot encoding an invalid character and then crush into another valid character. Great. Now let's take a look at how to resolve this conflict. And I also want to call out this is not the only way. Actually, it would be really great if you could come up with your own ways to deal with it. Okay, for me, I'm thinking about introducing escape character. I would consider ring backslash, but backslash by itself isn't valid. And I end up picking the percentage sign, and I'm going to prefix it with the mapped value. So less than becomes a percent one, and the greater than maps to percent two the blah 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 until percent 9. Okay, now if we do encoding, the encoded output would not bump into any numbers anymore. Taking the previous example, account column for 1k would be encoded to account percent 3 for 1k, and then it could be decoded back. At this moment, you might already realized I didn't really resolve the problem of conflicting, I just reduced the chance. I was bumping into a number, now I am bumping into a number prefixed by a percentage sign. So the problem isn't solved at all. Let's take a look at another example. The category name before encoding is large column percentage sign for 1k. Well, it's a wacky name, but you know what I'm doing. I am trying to introduce another conflict. And I know I did it successfully because uh, if I try to decode it, it might become large column quote zero 1k. So what is the problem? The problem is, before encoding, there's already escape character followed by number, and we want to break it. A trick to do that is to, interestingly, escape the escaper. Let's put the percentage into the mapping so that the escaper, the percentage sign in the unencoded string will be encoded into percentage 10. And the number 10 here will be the separator in between the percentage sign and the number following it. So let's try that on the last example. Large column percentage for 1k after encoding will output large percent 3 percent 10 for 1k. And once decoded, it will become the original string. That is good. However, check the encoded string again. After percent 3, does it have to be percent 10? Why could it not be percent 1 followed by 0? Now the decode is broke again. So where is the problem this time? In an encoded string, when we have 1 or 10 followed by the escaper, we don't know which case is which. And that is not difficult to address. We're going to predetermine how many digits will be there, and then pad it with 0. So for example, in an encoded string, percent %03 will always be mapped to column, and the percent %10 will always map back to percent %sign. There's no percent %1. So there's no confusion. Okay, that is the theory. We introduce an escaper. We will encode the escaper itself, and we have a fixed width for the encoded character. Let's take a look at uh, a version of implementation. What you're seeing now is reserved character processor. It is a class that uh, implements the I file name processor. I file name processor is an interface. It has two methods: encode encodes a file name, and it returns the encoded result, and decode do the reverse. So to implement reserved character processor, we need to provide both methods. On line 20, I defined an escape character that aligns what we have discussed. Then there's a list of evaluated characters. Following that, I put two regular expressions there, one for encoding, one for decoding. Line 28 and 29 both are creating regular expressions 
one thing to pay attention to that the escape character is always there in the expression along with the invalid characters. And we all understand that it's very important for conflict resolution. Move on to line 34, that is in the body of encode method. I am replacing any match of the invalid characters, including the escaper, with the four digits hex value of the character itself. Most of the code are easy to understand, except maybe on this line 34. So let me break it down a little bit. This replace method on a regex actually does two things. One, it finds out the matches. And two, it supplies a replacement for every each match. Let's take a look at the match part first. To understand that, I copied the invalid character's string. And I'm going to put it into a website I use frequently, that is regex101.com. I need to do a little bit of escaping for the expression by itself. And then we need to put in the escaper. And now it becomes the equivalent of the regular expression that I'm using in the code for encoding. In the main area, I could put in the string testing for matching. So for example, if I put down for 1k savings question mark, question mark will be matched. And then if I put the percentage, the escaper at a random location, that one will be matched as well. The match information will show up on the right hand side in the match information section and every character would be a match. And that's the first part, find out the matches in the string. The second part is a delegate to supply the replacement. Let me pull the logic out. M here is a match and its value is the special character. So what's happening after the escape character is that I'm converting the value to a short. Let's assume the match character is a question mark. This is equivalent to get the ASCII code for the character. And you'll see it in a bit that the ASCII code for question mark is 63. And to make it more compact, the next thing that I did was to convert it to hexadecimal. And then I specified the width for the result to be four digits. It is probably an overkill there. Two digits would be more than enough. So if I run the code, we're going to convert the question mark to 63, then 3F, then 003F. And we are prefixing it with the escaper character. So the end result for question mark is going to be percentage 003F. Compared to having a number mapped by ourselves, like what we discussed earlier, this one saves us from maintaining the mapping table. And of course, this is not my invention. This way of leveraging ASCII for encoding has been widely used in all around the places. Because of that, it brings in a little bit of readability into the encoded results. For example, percent two zero is a space, right? It's not important, but you get the point. I wish this makes things a little bit clearer, right? Now that you have the tools, I think you should be able to understand the decoder part of it. And let's take a look at some unit tests. Firstly, the escaper should be encoded correctly. That means percentage sign would be encoded to percentage 0025. Then I picked one of the special character. Since it is in a string, I just randomly picked uh, asterisk and expect the encoded value would be percentage 0028. And then I want to go a little bit further, just making sure when two special characters show up side by side, it can still do the encoding correctly. After that, it's just a special characters along with the other valid characters. And then a more complex case. And then we run the tests. It's five on five. Now let's take a look at type two. Compared to type one, the characters in type two are all valid characters for a file name, but they are reserved by the operating system for some other purpose. In addition, instead of single character, it is actually a string of three or four characters. They aren't actually too different. So as a start point, let's try the idea of prefix them with the, an escaper character. And as you can see on the table here, con be encoded to percent con and so on and so forth. And now you know the routines. We need to verify if there's conflicts. Let's take now as an example, it will be encoded to percent now. But what if the user is putting a category name of percent now to begin with? Since percent now is not on the encoding list, it will remain what it is. That means for an encoded string, we can't tell. Which origin does the percent now come from? And there you go, we have a conflict, right? 
and guess what is the resolution? Well, escape the escaper. We could encode the percentage to percentage 0025. A simpler way, though, is just to double the escaper. Let me show you what I mean. When we have percent no, it would become percent percent no. But you would ask, are we bumping to percent percent no in that case? We actually aren't. Of course, the percent percent no would become percent 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 no. Now we could safely decode the percent con back to con. So clear cut, no confusing, no conflicts. Let's take a look at the code. For type 2, I created another class named the reserved file name processor. It also implements iFile name processor. Scanning through the code, it is almost identical to reserved character processor, except the string of invalid characters become a list of reserved names. And we have a pre-encode to double the escaper character, as well as a post-decode to do the reverse. And here are the unit tests for it. First the test covers the basic. Second, make sure the encoder is case insensitive. The third one is about encoding the escaper. Fourth one is actually a negative test, making sure that it doesn't encode in partial match. Well, I left out the details about file extensions, but they are actually covered here by the last two unit tests. And if I run the tests, it's going to be six of six. This is something not tightly coupled with uh, encoding decoding, but I think it is something worth mention. You probably noticed we started with uh, one class for process reserved characters, and there is a set of unit tests covering it. And when we encounter a new case, aka reserved pile names, aka type two, instead of uh, opening and modified the first class, I created another class to deal with it. I use a list of services to make them work together for the encoding. Any input string will go over the first processor and then the second. And decode happens in the reversed order from second to the first. That is an intentional design and it is backed by the OC principle. That is to design system that is open for extension but closing for modification. With regarding this practice, it brought in several benefits. Firstly, the unit test is relatively easy to write. The class does one thing and does one thing well, and that one thing is straightforward for testing. And another benefit is I actually have to introduce another processor to deal with the tailing dot or space, because those characters aren't allowed there. But I don't need to touch any existing classes that has been well tested. As a side effect, I created a NuGet package to wrap up the path utility. I'm going to share with you both the package as well as the source code in the description below. Let's wrap this video up by doing the thing that we couldn't do before. Ready? Go! Alright guys, keep coding, keep improving, and I'll see you in the next one. Until then, take care!